Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Senior Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project. And I welcome you to the Direct Relief Education Series. Uh, it is a almost bi-monthly series on a variety of topics for the primary care provider. And today launches our fourth session in this series, a clinical approach to opioid addiction. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Timothy Fong. He is a professor of psychiatry at the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA, and he is board certified in adult and addiction psychiatry. He is the co-director of the UCLA Gambling Studies Program. The purpose of this program is to examine the underlying causes and clinical characteristics of gambling disorder in order to develop effective evidence-based treatment strategies. Dr. Fong is also part of the steering committee of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, whose mission is to address the most pressing questions related to the impact of cannabis, cannabis legalization through rigorous scientific study and discourse across disciplines. It has been a pleasure for Maven Project to partner with Direct Relief, and I'd like to briefly tell you about the two organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and medical education sessions like this one. If you have any interest in your clinic, whether it be a federally qualified health center, a free and charitable clinic, or community health center, um, please reach out to me and I'll include my email in the chat. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization. Founded in 1948, Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and their patients worldwide. They ship medicines and medical supplies to over 100 countries and all 50 U.S. states. In the United States, Direct Relief supports about 1,600 health centers, free and charitable clinics, and other safety net providers. They also provide cash funding in the form of grants and awards, and um, they are also happy to support your clinics as well. And then finally, um, just to mark your calendars for the upcoming direct relief education sessions, we have three fantastic sessions that are scheduled for August. The first one is Friday, August 12th at 12 noon Pacific time. It is Speak My Culture, Tips and Strategies to Better Equip You in Providing Culturally Appropriate and Sensitive Care to Your Latino Patients. On Thursday, August 18th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, Speak My Culture, Natural Healers and Culture Bound Syndromes in the Latino Community. And on Friday, August 19th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, Time Management and Preventing Burnout. So I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Fong. Welcome and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Einstein, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you, Kristen, as well, for setting this up. And thank you to uh, the MAVEN Project for inviting me out here to talk about clinical approaches to opioid addiction. So uh, you may have heard that introduction. Uh, I study gambling, I study cannabis, but at the core, I am an addiction psychiatrist. I finished my psychiatry residency here at UCLA in Los Angeles in 2002. And I was the first accredited addiction psychiatry fellow Back then in 2002, there was no opioid crisis, right? There was no opioid epidemic and we were just beginning to hear whispers. So I really wanna to bring today about 20 years of clinical experience that I've had in treating opioid use disorder and really focusing on really practical things that you won't find in textbooks that you can use in your actual day in day out clinical practice. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So let me click here. Um, we only have four goals and objectives. I know we have a wide range of an audience. And if you have any questions, go ahead and put it into the Q&A box and Dr. Einstein and I will answer them along the way when there's a, uh, some time. We'll have, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Number one, talking about prevention, diagnosis, and management of opioid use disorder in the outpatient setting. Whether you're doing telehealth, whether you have a walk-in clinic, whether you have a freestanding primary care clinic or even an urgent care clinic. I'm gonna talk about practical take-home points, things that you can do yourself as a, a general primary care and how to find an addiction specialist uh, in America right now. Evidence-based practices, to make sure we're doing the right things to reduce the anxiety and ambivalence about am I doing the right thing when it comes to opioids. And lastly, giving some options, resource limited settings. These would be no cost options, these would be things that have just been coming above since 2015 
uh, to provide support and guidance for primary care providers. So let's, let's rewind. Let's make sure we understand the state of affairs that we're in. The opioid crisis, nearly 20 years, since 1999, the rate of overdose deaths involving opioids, meaning prescriptions, heroin, and fentanyl have quadrupled in this uh, America. Now in 2022, we have more deaths annually caused by opioid overdoses than motor vehicle accidents. That public health impact crossed over a few years ago, and it's really shocking and staggering to think that's helped. Every day we have approximately 100 opioid overdose deaths throughout America. That's just 100 families, that's 100 lives are severely and permanently impacted every single day. In California alone, that number is about almost 5,000 deaths uh, per year. So we know that these are happening. The opioid crisis isn't just simply deaths, it's using more and more unregulated and illegal opioids. So of course, this would be increased heroin and subsequently increased fentanyl use. So all major markers over the last 20 years of heroin use have continued to be going up. Past month, last 30 days use, past 12 months use, percentages of heroin use disorder, opioid use disorder, all have gone up, particularly among the young people, 18 to 25. These are the ones that we're certainly very concerned about because they start off very early and it doesn't take much for overdose to happen. More heroin and fentanyl are available on the street. Just coming into the office today, I heard on the radio about a seizure of nearly a, I think it was $20 million worth of uh, heroin and fentanyl uh, alone, uh, just in tablet forms uh, in Los Angeles County. So we know that, that more and more is available. But here's an interesting practical nugget. And most folks don't start off using heroin. Most folks with opioid use disorder start with prescription opioids. And this has been true over the last decade, 15 years. It isn't just, let me go straight to heroin. An 18, 19 year old person doesn't say, let me try heroin. Let me try fentanyl. They usually get introduced by prescription opioids or prescription opioid pills. That doesn't mean they get a prescription for prescription opioids. That means you get access to the tablet. So that may be a friend giving them Vicodin. That may be them getting it off Snapchat. That may be at a party and someone giving them, introducing them to prescription opiate pills, which then ultimately begin the process of addiction. Graphically here, again, is that historic spike in US drug overdose deaths. And this was not updated, this was right in mid pandemic, but again, that number just is higher and higher since 2020. Here you see that stark figure of 92,000 drug overdose deaths, a uh, vast majority of them involving a combination of opioids or benzodiazepines, uh, uh, ultimately leading to death. Synthetic opioids, again, are driving at that overdose rate. So synthetic opioids, again, being fentanyl uh, is a main driver of that. And in fact, some people have argued this isn't an opioid crisis. What this is, is a heroin and fentanyl crisis. And I think that tends to diminish the fact that, again, it's a lot of prescription opioid overuse and prescription opioids that drive it. But it's still really fascinating to see how much of this is driven by synthetic opioids. Question I would say to you, why hasn't this stopped? We've known about this for 15 years. It's been in the news. It's been in the medical conferences. It's been in the literature. It's been in medical education. And yet we see no sign of it stopping. And I think it boils down to really four points that are really difficult. Access to various forms of opioids. Pills, heroin, fentanyl, incredibly easy. Incredibly easy in terms of where you can get them on the unregulated market or the illegal market. Some of this is driven by access on the internet and smartphones. A lot of it's driven by um, just to organize crime, uh, but there's so much drugs out there and not just parts of America, but throughout almost the entire all 52 states. The types of opioids that are available have of course become riskier and riskier and riskier. Uh, fentanyl of course driving so much of that where just a few milligrams, a few small percentages of that is enough to create a tremendous amount of damage. Next, the workforce to treat addiction is small. So 20 years ago versus now, the total number of board certified addiction psychiatrists, addiction medicine physician is probably on the order of about seven or 8,000. So that's out of nearly you know, a million physicians in America. We're talking about a tiny percentage, tiny percentage that actually are uh, board certified in addiction practices. So sorry about the construction. That's outside. I'll stop very shortly. 
I'll just talk a little louder into my speaker. And lastly, the coordination of care among stakeholders, only just beginning. So again, drug and alcohol treatment programs, not coordinating with mental health programs, primary care programs, not coordinating with dedicated addiction treatment programs, hospitals, not coordinating with outpatient care programs, and list can go on and on and on. Unfortunately, still a very fractured healthcare delivery system. Here's an example where, again, most of the prescription painkillers for non-medical users. So people that start by using opiates that aren't getting it by a doctor or who do get it by a doctor but are not using it for intended use, that's non-medical use. You see the big chunk of it is this gray bar given by a friend or relative for free, given by a friend or relative for free, followed by prescribed by multiple physicians stolen from a friend or relative, bought from a friend or relative, bought from a drug dealer or stranger. So number one for us as healthcare providers, that means we need to do a much better job of talking about safe storage of opioids and safe disposal of opioids. Because when you don't have excessive amounts of painkillers out there, you're not gonna be able to give it away. Um, when you have multiple prescription, that means we have to do better at taking the time to look at prescription database monitoring, as well as ensuring that there's only one provider of those opioids. So just a, a clear example where people are getting it from. Opioid related disorder. And again, as a psychiatrist and addiction specialist, I think it's crucial that we use proper terminology. So on this slide, I've laid out kind of the different term that we uh, prefer using. There's opioid use, which is using a prescription opioids in its intended practice. That's not addiction. There's opioid misuse or opioid non-medical use. That means, for instance, taking a Vicodin not for pain, but because you like the way it emotionally makes you feel. Or taking a, a Dilaudid and crushing it and snorting it. That's not how it was intended to be used medically. That is an opiate misuse. Opiate intoxication, of course, the state of intoxication that is problematic and creates problems from overuse for, or from using it. Opioid use disorder as the actual term for opiate addiction, that's the proper term. Opiate induced disorder is more of a psychiatric term when using things like opioid induced mood disorder, opioid induced anxiety disorder, opioid induced um, sleep disorder, things like that. I put a dotted line here from, for conditions we named we want to retire and put away. And in fact, because words matter dramatically. And so DSM-4 terminology, of course, was abuse and dependence. And these were terms that drove up stigma, drove up shame, continued to drive men and women with these conditions to say, I'm abusing opiates, again, creating that sense of shame and stigma that oftentimes would drive them away from treatment. Addict, of course, is oftentimes now wanting to be retired as a term. This is a person with opioid use disorder. Just like this is a person with asthma. Uh, the asthma doesn't define them. The addiction doesn't define them. And again, although it's a subtle change, it is a really crucial term. And I, and I noticed this in my own practice when I started using that, how often then, then people would then be willing to come back to treatment. I think that's really the crucial part. We're treating people as they are, a person with this disease, not as a drug addict or someone who did bad things, then they're more likely to come back into treatment. Opioid use disorder, uh, by definition, as you define it, is a really widely variable condition. When you lay out all the DSM criteria line by line, you'll see that all criteria, again, are weighted equally at one point. But it means if you have 10 patients with opioid use disorder, you get 10 really different histories coming in. And I think that's part of the mystery for a lot of primary care folks, because it isn't always the same. Sometimes they come in with intense craving and tolerance and withdrawal. Other times they come in using opioids in a continued pattern, but they're miserable physically, they're miserable emotionally, and they continue to use. Other times they come in and say, I've tried to cut down, I just can't do it. Or I have no money and I do all these other things to get my opioids. Again, that means 10 different stories, from 10 different patients. So I encourage people to look over those criteria and really capture that and realize that's why when we make those diagnoses, we have to be very careful and precise and spend the time to go through the different criteria. 
Screening and early detection, mainly in the primary care setting. And I think this is where it's really crucial. By the time patients call me as the expert in addiction, they know they have this disorder or they've been referred by a primary care doc for specialty care and addiction. But when they go into the primary care setting, right, and they have opioid use disorder, their chief complaint isn't, I have opioid use disorder. It's going to be what? I have pain. I can't sleep. I'm not doing well physically. Uh, I'm very tired. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm depressed. I don't do well. So I would encourage all primary care providers, again, go back and build in those expert techniques. That's the SAMHSA strategy for screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for risky substance use. An expert means using a normal or a standardized drug substance screener before you even talk to the patient. So here are a few examples of that. PHQ-9 is a common one. For opiates, the one I like is called the current opioid misuse measure. This is a no cost, completely free. You can download it from the internet and you can use it as a screening tool in the waiting room. You can put it on a kiosk. You can put it on an iPad. You can email it to them. Uh, they can answer on their smartphone. There are apps you can use. So all of this is about in an under-resourced practice clinic saying, we don't have time. We don't have the resources, but there are ways to get information before they come into the office. So a lot of times, even with my outpatients, I'll say, before you come into the office, I'd like you to fill out this screening battery, email it to me before you come in. And now we hit the ground running with additional information. So that's the idea about being creative uh, and where, when, and how to do it. And as a bonus, I'm sure many of the clinics know this, but if you're doing expert techniques, if you do a screener and you document its result and you document what you do when there's a positive result, that's an additional procedure or code that you can bill against on Medicare. Uh, I'm sure many F FQHCs know that, but if you didn't, look into that and just Google expert screening, expert reimbursement codes that are uh, available to you. Engagement, now there's one thing to just screen, but what good is screening if you can't get the person who's identified to be at risk to get involved in their engagement or a thicker assessment for substance use disorder or treatment? And unfortunately, you know that the vast majority of people with opioid use disorder no matter what stage of that disorder they're in, don't seek treatment. And why not? Well, we know why. The stigma, the denial, the lack of access to care. But there are others, the false belief that treatment will work. And I've had a lot of patients who have a false belief in what the treatments that are currently are available are. For instance, a lot of times they'll say, I don't want to go to methadone because I don't want to become like one of those. Or they'll say, I don't want to go on Suboxone because I don't want to get hooked on Suboxone. I don't want to exchange one drug dealer for another that happens to be a doctor. So those are false beliefs that we hear that. Or that if I'm on Suboxone, I'm still addicted and no, not really in recovery. And I think unfortunately we have a lot of patients with this disease that have complete lack of understanding. And they think that opioid use disorder is only heroin or fentanyl. That's not true. And many men and women with prescription opioid use disorder who think they're taking it for chronic pain but are still enduring symptoms of pain and distress, they think it's, I'm not getting enough opioids, but in fact, no, it's your opioid use disorder. So some strategies to think about, and think about your own practices. If you're doing a screening or you have a clinical interview and you know this person has is struggling with opioids and you know that their relationship with opioids is not helping their physical and mental pain. So some strategies include number one, collateral information. And of course, the electronic medical record has changed a lot of that. In California, we of course have our prescription database monitoring program called the Cures, uh, not named after the band of the 80s, but we use that obviously. And by law, we have to. Every state has their own different uh, cures. We don't have a national prescription database. Uh, I don't know if we will, but I think that would be very interesting. Um, the family visit, the idea of engaging all family members at the same time, in other words, you have the patient and their family members and really saying, look, addiction is a disease that impacts the family. Let's bring the family in sooner rather than later to discuss how their loved one's opioid use is impacting them. I think that's part of the strategy that really get people talking and get people motivated to say, we're gonna treat this as a family. 
for a lot of primary care providers, I, I hope people would do more of this where they schedule a visit and you call it specifically the mental health checkup, meaning that annually, in addition to your physical checkup, we're going to do a 15 to 20 minute uh, checkup that focuses only on your mental health. We're going to talk about mood, anxiety, sleep, uh, personality stuff, your general just quality of life from an emotional standpoint, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that are attached to mental health. I know it's very difficult for primary care because you're so swamped and so busy. And even you may only have 10 or 15 minutes, but I think there's something unique about defining it, saying today's checkup is only focusing on mental health. And I think that's the strategy now with telehealth. We can do these more frequently instead of say, you know, every, you know, couple of years, maybe every once a year, we're going to do a 15, 20 minute visit for mental health checkup. Um, and again, that's the whole idea about with telehealth, we've removed a lot of those barriers where patients, for instance, here at UCLA no longer have to drive in, fight Los Angeles traffic, pay $13 for parking to sit in a waiting room to get a 20 minute in-person visit. We've removed a lot of those barriers so we can actually have more frequent visits to shorter duration, 15, 20 minute visits. All right, so treatment approaches for addiction, treatment approaches for opioid use disorder. You go back to medical school and you think about, and you remember how we would learn biopsychosocial treatments for substance use disorder, biopsychosocial treatments for uh, mental health condition, biopsychosocial treatments for opioid use disorder. So that means when you're doing this in a primary care setting, you have to say, well, I can't just give medication. Well, what are the other things that I, as a primary care clinic, can do to, to get the bio, to get the psycho, and to get the social treatment? I'll go over a few ideas that I have. The first is always remembering that recovery for opioid use disorder really isn't just simply not using opiates. And the recovery is the goal of all medical conditions, which is finding a lifestyle where we have, we're free of taking substances, strong physical and mental health, and citizenship in the world where you're participating and having purpose and having passion and having better quality of life. So I think that's something a lot of primary care docs forget that recovery is not just simply the absence of substance, it's actually engaging in improving quality of life across all sorts of measures. As a quick reminder, in America right now, we have an, a, a, a very wide variety of workforce that provides treatment, again, that's fragmented throughout. This workforce is growing. This workforce needs to be uh, utilized more efficiently, I think. And that, I think, again, that's why telehealth will change a lot of this. From the physician standpoint, we have addiction psychiatrists and we have addiction medicine. They're different. Addiction psychiatrists, we, of course, use psychiatry and are more experts in the psychiatric medication, psychiatric treatments of co-occurring disorders. Addiction medicine, uh, looking at treating addiction, but also the co-occurring medical problems with that. Hepatitis, HIV, um, things like that. We're complementary. Uh, we work hand in hand, and sometimes you know we require both an addiction medicine and an addiction psychiatrist at the same time. Therapists throughout MFTs, LCSW, marriage family therapists, PsyDs. Again, this idea in a lot of FQHCs, are we starting to see more and more embedded mental health uh, workforce inside FQHC? And, and certainly, I hope we are. And Los Angeles, we're starting to see that more and more. And that's really where it's become effective is when you have those embedded therapists working alongside with everyone. That's different than counselors. And I think counselors are really, really incredibly useful. And pardon, I had this old term abuse in there from years ago, but peer or peer recovery counselors are incredibly useful for engagement. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of FQHCs can do this if they have the resources. If you don't, that's where things like partnering with 12 steps. And I've had a few clinics here in Los Angeles say, well, we can't afford to hire a peer counselor. But what we can do is host a 12-step meeting in our clinic after hours. And I think those are the sort of resources in combining uh, uh, with communities to, to put that out there. Psychosocial treatment settings for uh, substance use disorder, again, are a wide variety from rehabs, detox, intensive outpatient, partial hospital, methadone, OTP program, the list can go on and on and on. I put this up there because I think a lot of uh, primary care folks forget about this or realize I don't have direct access to a residential program 
or I don't know who I can send someone to or methadone. If you don't have this list, I think it's important to build that list out and say, okay, who are our community partners that we can send to when we have clients that need this? And I think that's, if we don't have them, if we're under-resourced, there have to be other places you can start building out. For instance, there are now virtual telehealth intensive outpatient programs. So programs that you can get two or three days a week of psychosocial treatments paid for by Medicaid, Medi-Cal, or by insurance. So again, that's the real trick is to say, how do we build up our resource binders so that we have those active resources there available to us? All right, so focusing on a lot on the medication part of this, of the opioid use disorder, because this oftentimes tends to be an area that many folks forget about or are underutilized or feel like, I don't know if I'm really equipped, am I trained to do this properly? So when I think about medications for opioid use disorder, they're really designed to do these five things. Manage the withdrawal symptoms. Keep withdrawal from escalating and getting worse. They're also to manage the core symptoms of opioid use disorder, which can be, again, urges, cravings for opioids, when the detoxification phase is over, that itch to use. Medications can dampen that considerably, and that's super important. Medications, when used properly, increase the likelihood of abstinence. So without it, you know, and if you're only doing 12-step, if you're only doing just psychosocial treatments, you're not going to get a robust treatment response. So I think describing that to patients at the start is really important. Say, hey, this is a medication that's going to help you maintain sobriety and abstinence. It's not going to cause you to be completely, but it'll help us. Reducing the harm from addiction. Again, if someone in the opioid world goes from injecting heroin 10 times a week down to twice a week, I view that as a significant improvement in the, in the treatment of this addiction. Uh, we reduce the likelihood of harm. It's still dangerous, absolutely, but that uh, danger has been reduced slightly. And medications lay the groundwork for them to be able to do the recovery. When you think about being in the throes of detox or withdrawal or just being in the midst of a, a, a drug use disorder where you have the urges of cravings, you're preoccupied, and you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you can't attend to life events. I think that's why it's so critical to recognize that medications allow you to stay focused so you can do the 12-step recovery, so that you can do the in-person uh, in um, therapy. I think that's super important to realize. Okay. So those are the expectations of what meds can do. And we get now to making sure we have an understanding of what tools we have out there. So for opiate withdrawal management, if you're doing this from the outpatient setting, if you're doing it from the hospital setting, you might have some differences in practices. But again, just a quick reminder of what we have out there uh, in terms of things that they can help. Methadone, and the key thing is if you cannot ever prescribe methadone from an outpatient clinic for the purposes of opioid withdrawal unless you are a licensed opioid treatment program. I see this a lot, and I think that's that's a huge, huge mistake. That's a federal guideline, that's a federal rule. You can't do that. Opioid agonist buprenorphine, of course, you can for opioid withdrawal. And then the other ones that are out there, and we've listed them, clonidine has been used for decades to manage the opioid withdrawal, particularly the, uh, uh, the sweating and the uh, elevated blood pressure that comes with it. Uh, a little bit of side effect. A uh, relative of clonidine and lofexidine, also FDA approved under the brand name Lusamira, uh, a little bit less sedation than clonidine, another different option um, that's available out there. It's been commercially available, I think, for about four or five years now. Uh, so that's another option you can do for the uh, hyperactivity associated with it. And again, you go back to what we learned in medical school for all the uh, supported medications for the antidiarrheals, antiemetics, ibuprofens, muscle relaxants, uh, things like that. We get now to the opioid use disorder itself and say, what do we have that's FDA approved for the condition of opioid use disorder? And we really have four main products, and really three in different formulations, methadone, buprenorphine, and now trexone. I'll go through these in, in a second. The first, of course, is buprenorphine. And this came to market in 2004. So we really now have 18 years of experience. 
the interesting thing about buprenorphine, it comes in a lot of different varieties and shapes. You have a sublingual mono product, which is just buprenorphine alone. You have sublingual combo product, which is buprenorphine combined with naloxone. You have different names, subsolve, suboxone, subutex is brand names, Bunavale, which is also a buccal film. So that's not sublingual. It's actually a, almost like a sticker that's applied to the, to, the, um, um, to the cheek there, but it's a combo product. And then you have Supplicate, which is injectable buprenorphine alone, where it's injected uh, it's a sub Q into the abdominal quadrant uh, once a month. So suddenly it gets really confusing, but it also means we have a lot of different treatment options. Now, to prescribe buprenorphine, again, how it works, buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. In order to prescribe it for opioid use disorder for a long time, physicians had to, of course, take the eight-hour course from the DEA uh, uh, in order to apply for a waiver from the DEA to allow you to prescribe it. What that waiver means, it goes all the way back to a law of data 2000, basically saying that uh, we're waiving the federal ban on prescript physicians prescribing opioids to treat opioid use disorder. So that's why we call it a waiver. Um, now there has been some changes where pay, or doctors don't necessarily have to do the training or to prescribe it. I personally feel though, because we have so much great training tools out there, it makes sense that it, before you start prescribing buprenorphine to do the training, which is available online uh, and to do that. Buprenorphine as a partial opiate agonist takes away the withdrawal, manages and attenuates withdrawal symptom, and then obviously also manages the urges and cravings you get from opioids moving forward. Because it's a partial opioid agonist, that means the uh, threat of overdose is, is limited because there's a ceiling effect. Um, the misuse potential is also limited because of the naloxone. So if when you use a combo product like Suboxone, the naloxone is bioavailable only when it's injected. So if you take it sublingually, the naloxone does not get absorbed into the body. When you inject it, it does get into the body and becomes activated that way. So that's a way of uh, minimizing misuse and uh, harm that way. Here's a visual of that. Again, we think about uh, partial agonists uh, right there. That means we are gonna have a ceiling effect with receptor activity. That means even if you take a mega, mega dose, you're only going to get a maximum amount of receptor activation. Um, unfortunately, on the versus the um, full agonist, where as the dose goes up, of course, you have percentage of receptor activity going up and ultimately um, uh, respiratory depression that follows. Here's a visual of what um, a Sublox um, um, buprenorphine film product looks like. And again, tablets, film, buccal sticker version. Those are all kind of the oral uh, ingestible version. So what patients will do, this is an example where they'll take a two milligram film strip of buprenorphine naloxone, place it under their tongue sublingually, and it'll take about five to eight minutes for it to dissolve. The taste is not particularly wonderful, but many folks are able to tolerate kind of a sharp, bitter taste. Sometimes they think it's a little minty, but it's not meant to be enjoyable because if it were, it would be reinforcing that people would want to take it all the time because they like the taste. But this is definitely an area where I think a lot of docs tend to forget about it and ask the person, you know, what's it like to take it? Uh, what's the taste? How long does it take for you to dissolve and things like that? This is um, um, switching gears now. That's buprenorphine in a nutshell. We can talk more about it in the Q&A, how to use it from a clinic setting. In short, when I prescribe it for buprenorphine, the patient comes in, intake, I prescribe her first dose after getting a urine drug screen. They pick up that first dose of uh, some, uh, buprenorphine and they start it in our clinic on their own at home with us guiding them along uh, the process. Every clinic will have different um, procedures how to do it. The second FDA-approved medication for opioid use disorder, of course, is now Trexone, oral or injectable. Here, extended release injectable naltrexone, trade name Vivitrol, injected uh, once a month. Uh, right there, you can see it in the gluteal uh, in, in the hip muscle area. Extended release Vivitrol or naltrexone has been around on the market now for nearly uh, ten plus years, with a wealth of data showing that 
those men and women who are on extended release, decrease substance use, improve treatment retention, reduce craving, better quality of life, good tolerability. Now, as a psychiatrist, I don't tend to go into the lane of injections. This is why extended release now trexone in the hand of primary care clinics is a really valuable tool. This is not a controlled medication. It's injected once a month, 380 milligrams of blocks receptors for the entire month, uh, very low tolerate. And I think this is really where getting into that pattern where patients are coming in once a month for their naltrexone shot to keep their opioid use disorder manageable, that's ongoing treatment. And that's absolutely how it should look. Uh, oral naltrexone, I still use from time to time. We can still use it. The downside of oral naltrexone for opioid use disorder is of course compliance. Uh, so anytime people have breakthrough urges or they don't get, pick it up or they miss the dose, uh, that's when the, the opioid use disorder symptoms may return. So now Trexone, um, oral and injectable. So that's number two. Opioid use disorder uh, medication number three, of course, is methadone. Again, as we mentioned that before, methadone only delivered in the hands of a federally approved opioid treatment program, never from an outpatient office if you're doing it without a federal license. Psychosocial treatment modalities to think about things you can even think about inside an FQHC or under-resourced clinic. Uh, things you can do, again, we talked about the idea of embedding, getting uh, psychosocial providers inside that clinic, even through telehealth, even having it there. But now we're starting to have more electronic health apps. And I wanna highlight one, it's called Reset O. This is an FDA approved app that you can download on your phone uh, at no cost, and as a doc, you have to quote, prescribe it. The patient can then download the software once they get the login code. And it's a series of modules they do throughout the week that are cognitive behavioral therapy based, motivational intervening based, managing urges and cravings, combined with a little contingency management where if they do enough modules per week, they can actually get gift cards to local stores like Target. Wait a minute, what is this that we're hearing about? I've never heard these before. Again, these are electronic health support apps that are treatment modalities to so support additional medication support. So again, take a look at that, Google that. It's done by Pair Therapeutics. The product is called Reset O. And uh, that's what I highlight there. Uh, Narcan is a major, major part of what we're doing for opioid use disorder, and it should be part of every FQHC's workflow. Narcan, again, is a stark reminder uh, of a um, reversal blocker, displaces opioids, reverses effects, available FDA approved for a reversal of opioid overdoses in the IV, subcutaneous, intramuscular, and intranasal. So we have a wide variety of different ways of getting Narcan in people. Of course, the main version on the outpatient sector is going to be the Narcan nasal spray. But I also highlight this one. And if we were alive, I'd ask if anyone knows the name of this. This, of course, is Evzio, the auto injector. It's certainly going to be preferred over the Narcan nasal spray because it's much easier to use. Unfortunately, it's much, much more expensive and tends to be not covered. This is the Narcan nasal spray, and you can see it down here in the corner. That tends to be the preferred version of Narcan that we're prescribing to outpatients. Which outpatients should get this? Certainly ones who have a history of overdose, the ones who have active opioid use disorders, or any patient now who I believe is actually being prescribed opiates should get uh, Narcan uh, as well. Here's a slide of, uh, give you an example of what that Narcan nasal spray would look like, um, as well as the injectable. What's gone out of favor are, are community clinics assembling Narcan injectable kits where they would give people uh, a syringe and Narcan inside it, and they actually give it to them. That used to happen. Um, I don't think a lot of clinics are doing that anymore. And again, the Narcan nasal sprays are much, much more affordable, are covered by a lot of um, uh, state agencies here in LA County. I know a lot of our patients can get like two Narcan nasal sprays at no cost and have them available. Okay. So a couple of ideas I have, and these are just opinions. These are just ideas I have for the under-resourced clinic that may not have the backing of, you know, large, large uh, health system. 
things you can do to improve our resources. And number one is to know what resources are out there. CDC has guidelines for prescribing opiates for chronic pain. We know about this, but actually putting those practices in place is important. We see a lot of folks in primary care that are still reflexively prescribing chronic pain to or opioids for chronic pain to patients they know do not benefit from opioids that do not do that. And again, when you boil it down to, again, it's hard work to do this. It's a hard conversation and it can be difficult because we, we, we are concerned for patient or we are uncomfortable with how do I actually taper that off. The first resource I wanna highlight that's no cost is the pccsnow.org. This is the provider clinical support system funded by um, SAMHSA, managed by our American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. And this website, and when you go on there, you're gonna get all sorts of incredible information. Number one, they do the X waiver training for buprenorphine. And they have well over a hundred different webinars and videos that are already out there on a vast variety of topics related to opioid use. So things like how to manage chronic pain, how to do opioid withdrawal, how to deal with co-occurring depression, how to deal with uh, opioid reversal agents. So how to just prescribe buprenorphine, how to start people on buprenorphine. So I would encourage people to look at that. Also in the spirit of mentoring that Maven does, the PCS system has one-on-one -on -one mentoring there as well, where you can request a mentor and get clinical supervision. You can get training for your clinic, for your nursing staff, all at no cost. So a lot of great resources that are available to your clinic. Um, similarly to PCSS now is another kind of federal response that's called the Opioid Response Network, also by SAMHSA. This is a little bit different than PCSS. I think of PCSS as a, as a vast library of information to learn from and be able to reach a few mentors. This Opioid Response Network is to get an actual mentor. And you can see here, ORN provides training and technical assistance versus local experts to that clinic. So for instance, I do some of this work where we provide technical assistance to clinics in Los Angeles. And we actually talk to them about how to set up treatment programs, how to do screening, how to manage workflows, how to find gaps to get patients you identify as opioid use disorder into proper treatment. Again, you submit a request, you'll get a response back and begin to access. So the kind of work I do with, we'll, we'll do like um, supervision phone calls or I'll jump on a Zoom call and we'll just do a Q and A or we'll actually go on site and talk about how to actually get uh, proper uh, medication storage or proper uh, medication uh, dispensing. Another, uh, another great resource is our American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. This is a large national professional organization uh, take a look at their website. We have a lot of information there. And I highlight, they also have their annual meeting. We also have um, in their annual meeting, a board review course on addiction. So if you feel like, you know, I didn't get enough training on addiction and I, I don't have the time to read and I don't really have enough knowledge and I want to increase it, you can take a, a time to do the board review course of which this year it is virtual. It is self-paced and self-directed. We also are doing our live annual meeting uh, in December, where you can, if you are able to get a few days off, you can get two or three days of a lot of addiction training very, very quickly at a, a pretty affordable price. And lastly, SAMHSA has tremendous amount of resources for clinics, uh, and it can take time to go through them. They have printed material, they have treatment improvement tips, they have books, they have practice guidelines that all can be delivered in real print or online. I, I've highlighted here, uh, there are buprenorphine quick start pocket guide for any clinicians that are beginning to think about, I do want to prescribe buprenorphine from this clinic. How do I do that? How do I get that set up properly? How do I do it within standard medical practice guidelines? All of that is there inside the SAMHSA resources there. So I want to reflect back for a few things um, about, let me, oh, here's a great question. Um, how soon can Suboxone be repeated after finishing one course? So that goes back to, I think the question is about one course of Suboxone. Usually what I do, I 
start patients on, I say, I want you to continue to take in Suboxone if you're benefiting from it and until you can achieve a solid, at least a year of recovery. This is designed to be a medication for people to stay on until they are in full recovery. If you only do a two week course of Suboxone for the only for opioid detox, the relapse rate back to opioids is exceptionally high. It's almost 80%. So the goal for Suboxone or uh, buprenorphine in my mind is to get people into recovery, to do the work of recovery and to get substantial impact from there. We have plenty of time for Q&A, I'll get to that set. I wanna highlight this because it's really stark. When President Obama was still in office, my gosh, you can imagine six years ago, he had a roadmap of what we as a nation are supposed to, we're gonna do in the next eight to 10 years to address opioid use. This was that action list. This should still be the action list of every FQHC. And we have done very well in some areas, we've done very poorly in this action list. And, it, and I encourage every clinic who's under resources to write out, what can I do? Number one, to expand access to treatment for our, our, our patients. Does that mean we have to get more providers inside our clinic? Does that mean we need to have more linkages to outpatient programs We can do it? How do we do that? How do we do these combined mental health and addiction task force? Too often we see addiction treated in isolation and only addiction only centers. It's not, it really needs to be part of all that mental health combo. How do we prevent the overdose deaths? Are we as a clinic, as a standard practice, constantly giving out Narcan, constantly talking about Narcan, constantly asking a patient. So imagine not just patients who get prescribed opioids, but saying to a family member, is anyone else in your family getting prescription opioids? And they say, yes, giving that person, that family member access to Narcan is another example of, 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 of Narcan uh, that we wanna get out there. Getting substance use disorder treatment parity, meaning getting paid at the same rate as primary care and specialty service. Not quite there yet. Uh, getting parity so that we get more providers motivated to increase uh, their services. Implementing syringe services programs. This is not the old term needle exchanges. Syringe services programs are programs that are full service where we take injection drug users and ensure that they get access to uh, not only syringes, but also addiction care. Well, in New York, we know about injection sites that have started just this year, and we're starting to get really interesting returns on it from a public health perspective. And lastly, the idea of mandating opioid use disorder treatment uh, education in medical schools. This was an Obama principle. So at a lot of FQHC, you do a lot of treatment, you, uh, or you do a lot of training and really thinking, should we embed mandated opioid use uh, training to our entire staff? If so, what would that look like? Okay. A few other things I think are really crucial, proper drug disposal, this is rarely talked about. And you go back to how we're supposed to get rid of controlled substances. It's according to the DEA and the FDA websites. Number one, any patient that has excessive medication, a medicine drug take back program is great. But who's really gonna you know, take your Saturday, collect all your drugs, get in the car, drive around and drop it off. It doesn't happen every Saturday either. There are DEA approved authorization collection sites. And I encourage your FQHC to say, if we're not, what do we need to do to create this proper DEA approved collection site that we can throw these medications in and get it in? For instance, here at UCLA, we have these sites. They're just strong lock boxes, you know, that almost look like those mail-in uh, vote boxes. It can't be tampered with. People, patients can throw their extra medications in and then appropriate DEA and state officials and county officials come by to collect the uh, medications properly. What should never be done and, and is not is pharmacies can't take it back. And we can't tell patients and when you have extra medicine, just take it back to the pharmacy. We've done that for years and that's not proper. That is technically a violation of, 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 of drug handling procedures. Getting rid of non-controlled substances in the trash, that's how you do it. But controlled substances, that means benzos, amphetamines, uh, extra opioid opiates, 
if you have no other way of getting rid of them, according to the uh, federal guidelines, it's to flush them down the toilet, which is a shock to a lot of people, but that's how you're supposed to do it. From a public health standpoint, we don't spend nearly enough time talking about proper drug storage, making sure only the person intended can get to it, and proper drug disposal. And as an example of that, a few years ago, I uh, got uh, a peritonsillar abscess. I went to the emergency room. I walked out of the emergency room with 30 tablets of Vicodin. I never used a single tablet of Vicodin. That Vicodin pill bottle sat in my medicine cabinet for nearly five years. And I never thought, as an addiction specialist, I should just get rid of it. I just never thought about it. And I think that's a perfect example where there was a essentially a lethal amount of opiates that were just lingering, unprotected, open in my own medicine cabinet. So it's a huge area, I think, that resource communities really should look at. Prescription database. Monitoring programs are now uh, the state of the art and standard of care. So that has to be embedded. We put that there. This is our state of California one called the Cures. I put in a number of other websites again uh, to highlight, uh, to build up your online resource directory there. And here's my contact information. Again, I'm a PCSS mentor. I'm also an opioid response network mentor, but I'm also an addiction psychiatrist. So no matter where you are, if you have questions related to a substance use, you're curious and need guidance, email me, drop me a line. Um, that's my Twitter handle. I don't get a lot of followers, but we'll respond to direct messaging there because um, we're all in this mission together to try and address opioid use disorder. So I'm just making myself as a resource out there. Uh, I'm well connected to a number of other national organizations and national resources that can provide wherever you are at. All right, so let's take a look at these great Q&A. Dr. Einstein, I don't know if you want to come back on screen, but we can do this together. And we'll go from there. Wonderful. Dr. Fong, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. And um, I know that you can see the, the q and I'll just throw out the questions to you. Um, first is, is it common for patients to relapse? You know, it is. But it's also common for patients with diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and cancer to relapse as well. The key is how do we respond emotionally to a, a client relapsing? And for years, in my early years, I used to think of it as such a, such a failure on my part, or what did I do wrong, or, or, or worse, I would have countertransference, say, oh my gosh, this guy's, quote, screwing up again. That's all dangerous stigma and language. We have to accept and acknowledge that substance use disorder, uh, by definition, is a chronic relapsing condition. And we should not so much embrace the relapse, but be prepared for relapse to, to say that when they happen, that we keep it short. I have so many patients that they come in, the shame of going back to using substances prevents them from calling me. So they, they relapse and they use, and they, they, they call me almost two, three, four, five weeks later. I said, why didn't you call me after day one? Well, I was so ashamed. I thought you were gonna get mad at me. I thought you were gonna abandon me. That's all stigma. That's all trauma they've learned through years of being told that they're no good. So the question isn't so much, is it common? The question is, yeah, it happens, but I am not gonna get upset. I am not gonna feel bad about myself and I'm not gonna get frustrated. I'm gonna say, I expect it to happen, but how do we minimize uh, that harm? And getting patients engaged in treatment is important. So a lot of times what I'll do is if I haven't heard from a patient, I, I'll reach out and say, I haven't heard from you in a couple of months. Drop me a line on how you're doing. Um, let's uh, set up an appointment. Okay, next question or comment. Great, um, if you wanna read Dr. Wartenberg's um, comment. And he's Dr. Wartenberg is a stalwart. <laughs> he uh, he is. <laughs> oh gosh, he could be doing this thing in his sleep. So um, physicians need to know that patients will find opposition to their uh, Medication for opioid use disorder at many, in all caps, NA meetings and folks in 12-step treatment. They need to have some training on how to manage this and how to find meetings where this is less likely to occur. Again, you're highlighting something that we've been working with for years, which is working with 12-step community to say, this is medication, this isn't drug addiction. So I have a saying, I, I, I don't know where I got it from. It might've been from someone like Dr. Wardenberg, I don't know, which is, Substances are things that we put in our body that change the way our body functions. 
medications are substances that restore normal functioning in our bodies. Drugs are substances that change the way our body functions. So I tell patients is that I am giving you a scientifically proven substance, a scientifically proven medication of restoring normal functioning of your body, your brain, and your mind. When folks, and I say to them, when you go to a 12-step meeting, it is absolutely your personal choice to disclose whether or not you are on medications or not. And if you feel you're being stigmatized or if you feel your relationship with your medication is being distorted because of men and women in that meeting, I encourage you to seek out other meetings where it's not. Um, and I think that it is important for physicians who are recommending 12 step to say that to patients in front and say, hey, hey, before you go, know that you may get a lot of flack. And let's talk about how you're gonna deal with that. I've had so many patients that stopped taking the medication because of their experiences in 12 step. But I've now since, recognize that. And in the first prescription I give to them, I say, if you're going to go to 12 step, this is a private matter between you and I, what I'm giving you. You do not have to disclose to them exactly what you're doing. But if you feel like you do, uh, then you can, but be well aware, you may get pushback from that there as well. Okay. Next question. Great. Dr. Fung, um, would you mind um, unsharing or stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And we can see your beautiful face. Um, next question is, is Suboxone or Vivitrol well tolerated by patients? Oh, absolutely. And again, let's break them down. Well tolerated means initial uh, medication dosages and not having major, major side effects. So with Suboxone, I usually start, or buprenorphine, I usually start off anywhere between four to eight milligrams on day one. If I started maximum dose, like 32 milligrams, yeah, and then you can have sort of sedation and, and difficulties. Um, for the vast majority of folks I started with, with standard doses of Vivitrol, um, injectable or oral naltrexone, they are well tolerated. So that, that's a, a pretty easy one to go. Great. Question, I think I'll tie it in. Mm -hmm. How do you calculate the starting dose of Suboxone? Again, this is in and of itself a whole different uh, webinar in and of itself. If you don't have a clinical experience, this is where it can seem overwhelming. This is why we had the mentorship. For me, I'll give you an example. I did this two weeks ago. I had a patient, she was taking about uh, eight tablets a day of um, Norcos uh, that she was getting from an illicit source. Uh, I saw her, we agreed outpatient buprenorphine was appropriate for her. Um, our first meeting, I said, after our meeting, you need to go get some labs. And then when you get the labs, after I review your labs, I'm gonna prescribe for you uh, buprenorphine. The first prescription I wrote to her was buprenorphine slash naloxone, two milligrams slash 0 0.5. Two film strips um, on day one, plus one additional film strip every two hours to alleviate withdrawal symptoms. So that was like the first dose. So her first dose she took on day one, she took four and then she ended up taking uh, two more for a total of eight. So then on day two, that meant her starting dose was eight. So it gets a little confusing, which is why SAMHSA has those uh, dosing start guides. Everyone can develop your own uh, style, how you dose buprenorphine, which is really, I think the best part about it. You prescribe it and you do it in a way that you're comfortable with and in line with the resources that you have. Great. Um, how do you determine which drug form to use per patient if finances were equal? Wow, that's an amazing question. Thank you for that. Um, a lot of it depends on, again, um, what's the, the most uh, you know, clinically relevant one. The cost, if there's no insurance coverage, buprenorphine can cost anywhere between 4 to $10 per tablet or per film strip. So if you're taking, you know, 12 to 16 milligrams a day, let's say that could be 10 or $20 a day times 30, you know, you're now looking at 300, you know, $500 a month. Um, a good RX can oftentimes reduce that cost. But again, we're finding more and more and more states that are covering buprenorphine um, on their state formulas, on their county formulas. So that shouldn't necessarily be a cost. Injectable now Trexone, same thing, very expensive out of pocket, like $1,500 a shot. Um, $1,000 a shot, 
but most insurance companies are covering that. I think where I get a little bit frustrated is commercial insurance. So patients with private insurance, high deductibles, prior authorizations, that's when we start to get a, a strange delay in treatment that gets a little bit annoying. But for under-resourced communities, it's going to be more about what's on our county uh, formulas. What does our state regulations allow us to do? Um, uh, and I think that that's the consideration that I do. I, I tend not to worry so much about cost in the beginning because I know I'm not going to, I, you know, I'm not going to prescribe something I know that they can never prescribe uh, afford. So I'm really going to focus on how can we get around this, and there are ways around it other than just paying out of pocket. So that's good. Thank you. Can you comment on your experience with using Suboxone with younger adults and adolescents when they meet the criteria? You know, this is interesting. Suboxone or uh, buprenorphine, again, is FDA approved for opioid use disorder 18 and up, 18 and up. Um, most of my folks that I've used that are in that younger age group, I don't use um, uh, medication. I tend to want to get them into a more structured program, like a residential program. Uh, but the ones that I have done, it's been the same dosage as adults, particularly if they're the same, you know, weight, if they're the same uh, maturity, you know, physical maturity level. I think that that's uh, where it goes. I think it is interesting. We don't have, and we, we are starting to get more, we're starting to get more longer term data of Suboxone over like 10, 15 years. And there's a couple of things that have emerged. Number one, unlike methadone, uh, there has not been associated with uh, kind of uh, changes in cognition or potential concentration issues that we do see with long-term use of methadone. Also, oral dentition. We're starting to see patients who use Suboxone for 10, 15 years. There is now a very clear recommendation for them to get annual dental care. Now, that should happen anyway, but there is something maybe unique about the buprenorphine product we don't know if it's the buprenorphine or the sublingual experience that does seem to be associated potentially long-term use with uh, more dental uh, adverse outcomes, things like caries and abscesses and things like that. So again, I, I think part of the strategy is younger adults, again, 18 and under are different than 18 and 24, which is the transitional age youth, uh, but still looking at using those products, at least in my mind, they can be effective, but I tend to be a little bit more um, conservative there just because um, uh, of, of the long-term effects down the road. Great. And then what are some ways patients can cope with sublocate injection pain? Well, um, that refers to injection site reactions, which uh, are combinations of erythema, um, pain. Uh, and number one, the first thing is to make sure it's not infected. You know, if it's actually infected, then you're gonna to have to you know, prescribe antibiotics. Um, some folks have used uh, a combination of uh, lidocaine topical. Um, some folks have just used standard uh, menthol rubs. Um, some folks have used uh, heat packs as well. Um, Advil, ibuprofen, uh, os, Tylenol, kind of the standard stuff. I even had uh, a few patients you uh, can't recommend it, but I'll just tell you what they did. They just use these kind of topical CBD rubs you know, whether or not that's effective or not. I cannot recommend that uh, officially above board. I'm just saying what people have done that anecdotally has said to me that they liked. But for the most part, you go back to why are we getting injection pain? It really doesn't have anything to do with um, technique. It really, unfortunately, probably has to do with just genetic response to uh, the various chemicals that are in sublocate. But for the patients that I have had it, letting them know that, you know what, it's going to go away. The topical lidocaine probably is the first line that I tend to uh, recommend, along with uh, uh, the heat uh, uh, packs and uh, ibuprofen. Great. Dr. Timothy Fong, thank you so much for an excellent presentation today. I appreciate uh, your thoughtful preparation in focusing on aspects for the clinic providers that are working in the safety net clinics. Um, so I think that that was particularly helpful um, to have you provide those kind of tips. Um, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with all of us. And a huge thank you to all the clinic providers that are out there on the front lines caring for your patients. And um, a big thank you to you that your patients are lucky to have you. 
Um, as a reminder, we have some wonderful um, direct relief education sessions that are coming up. Again, there are two talks that are on speaking my culture and caring for Latino patients. That's on Friday, August 12th, Thursday, August 18th. And then on Friday, August 19th, time management and preventing burnout. And you'll be receiving um, emails about how to register for those sessions through Maven Project in partnership with Direct Relief. So everyone have a wonderful weekend and we look forward to seeing you at our next sessions.